Hello, everyone. I think we'll get started. Maybe we'll leave the doors open. I expect we have probably a few stragglers coming in, and we have a lot of folks on Zoom. So thank you for coming in. I hope everyone is going to take the opportunity to have some of our snacks. We have some really yummy Valentine's Day cupcakes from a local uh, baker uh, who made them especially for us. So good afternoon. I'm Amy Hackwood-Merg. If you don't know me, I'm Associate um, Professor and Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion here in the School of Nursing. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the School of Nursing's Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, or JEDI Committee, um, welcoming you today to, um, to hear from our honored guest, Dr. Rodney Herring. Um, he's going to share his wisdom and experience with us today. Before my introductions, I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge the land upon which the University of Buffalo operates. We're on the territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy. Hopefully I got that right or close enough. Today, this region is still the home to the Haudenosaunee people, and we're grateful for the opportunity to welcome our speaker today on this land. Dr. Herring is the inaugural director of the Roswell Park Center for Indigenous Cancer Research and Roswell Park Center for Indigenous Cancer Services. He serves as research faculty at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center's Office of Community Outreach and Engagement in the Department of Cancer Prevention and Control. He's past fellow of the National Congress of American Indians in the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Herring's an enrolled member of the Seneca Nations of Indi Nation of Indians, the Beaver Clan, and resides on the Cataraugus Indian Reservation. He holds a doctoral degree in social work from UB, has more than 15 years of social work practice, and served as a former delegate on the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, American, Indian, and Alaska Native Health Research Advisory Council. Dr. Herring is also the lead delegate for the historic Memorandum of Understanding between Roswell Park and Indian Health Services, with the common mission of addressing health burdens in Indigenous communities. He's a recipient of the National Health Board's Impact Award in 2017 and the National Federation of Just Communities Hero Award in 2021. Dr. Herring's research inter interests intersect in the goal of eliminating disparities and encouraging resiliencies within indigenous. and Indigenous communities. So please join me in well, uh, wishing Dr. Herring a warm welcome um, for his talk uh, Treaty and Wampum Responsibilities. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I, I went to UB here. I started in a, in a school study group. Actually, the chair of my uh, dissertation committee is here. So thank you for, for coming. And also uh, a colleague of mine, Mr. Seneca, uh, who's also uh, from Seneca Nation. And our other relations here perhaps throughout the, our indigenous communities and everybody here in West New York, very thankful for um, the opportunity to come back to UB. I did walk these halls, uh, you know, I, I took classes here in the nursing school and you know, it was a, an awesome uh, learning experience. And uh, since that time I've traveled around the world and uh, came back home, I never really left home, uh, held residence on the Cataraugus territory of Seneca Nation. But uh, I had the opportunity to work at different in different areas across the country, and then come full circle back here at Roswell Park, uh, hold affiliations still at the uh, University of Arizona, and also um, the Stevens Cancer Center um, at OSU in Oklahoma. Today, I'm going to share a little bit about uh, treaty and uh, wampum responsibilities, and kind of the intersects about how that um, plays into our work that we've been putting together. And you know, hopefully, it shares ideas and inspires you to think about how to incorporate, um, when when it's applicable, um, some of these notions into the work that you do, either clinically or in a research context. Let's see, I figure this out here. I'll share a little bit about our work at the at Roswell Park uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it was probably literally the week of and everything shut down, we were gonna have a grand open. We started, we had the date set, we we're sending out invites and then uh, the world changed. <clears throat> but it didn't stop us from our vision that we had of creating the center. And part of that vision was, uh, you know, putting our mission together with our community advisory board. We have an intertribal uh, community advisory board. And we had three things that um, 
that we heard from our communities. And that wasn't different, very different from other communities across the country and across the world. One for ind indigenous communities was um, the idea of really looking at what health means to us in a prevention, inter health intervention, behavioral context. So a lot of our research to practice um, focuses on that. You know, how do we translate research into the health and well-being um, in a behavioral context or a prevention context? The second one was in, uh, environment. And what is the, uh, how does uh, the environment, like the physical environment, the water, uh, the air, the soil, and how does that interplay with the health of our, of the conditions of the people? And the third one was really uh, based on the education of our youth and our upcoming leaders. And how do we provide uh, context and opportunities to integrate opportunities for, for our young, younger generation to be, for example, the next um, generation of cancer scientists, health researchers, MDs, physicians, or nurses. And so those were our kind of three pillars that our, our community want us to uh, focus on. And that's kind of how we framed our work in our center. Outreach was very important too. And um, I always challenge universities to think about what is your strategy for Indian country? What, what is your proximity to native nations and, uh, and where you work? And what do you know about that? Does your university have a strategy for working with natives and the tribes from the government to government to university standpoint? If not, now's the time to think about that. And so um, outreach is definitely part of that. How do we get, how do we provide information from what we're learning and how we're working in the clinics here? Um, working with native patients that come into your clinics and how do we outreach back into the communities where, they, where we come from? So those are kind of the, the things that we wanted to put together. And I put this on here because uh, um, the bundled arrow approach is something, you know, um, in the Hiawatha belt, you may have seen this uh, symbolism um, as you, travel across campus or in the communities. But it's actually a wampum belt um, that was created that bridged our tribes back together um, in the time when we were so nice to each other. Like many nations, we had our issues and problems and, and concerns. And, and uh, it's a really historic um, way that we came back together. Um, basically, a message of peace was brought to each one of our tribal nations across the uh, Haudenosaunee or the Six Nations, or you may have heard of us uh, called as the Iroquois or Iroquois in many of your uh, textbooks growing up. But we re ourselves refer to our, um, us as uh, Haudenosaunee or people of the Longhouse. And traditionally, um, the, there's five uh, native nations in this region. We span all across New York, into Ontario, and into Quebec. And when the, this message of peace came to us and was delivered to each nation, eventually we came together as uh, one confederacy of nations and a peaceful mindset to work um, together collectively and jointly towards governance, towards keeping our culture in place, towards the health and well-being of our, of our people and our nations. And so um, there's a story about also about how our um, you see the five arrows that are uh, put together as one. And you know that was part of our thinking too, is like how if uh, if there was a, a warrior that was asked to come up and, and break an arrow. And so they came up, broke the arrow, not, and didn't have any problem with that. And, uh, and then they asked, um, they bundled five arrows, which represent each one of the five nations, asked a, a warrior to come back up and try to break that, and I could not break that because they were together in strength and, and harmony and bundled together. And that's kind of how our nations are traditionally. And in, in current times, we have levels of that too, togetherness and collectiveness. But working together, uh, we're as a Confederacy nations or Haudenosaunee, we have a lot of strength in that capacity. Um, individually, um, in the beginning of time, when we, you know, when we were going our different ways, we didn't have that strength. But now that we're together, we're probably the we are um, the largest on the east, the northeast coast here, and in Canada, the Six Nations, um, where our relations um, before the U.S. and Canada, same people. Um, the uh, Six Nations Reserve, Canada has about 25,000 citizens and is the first, uh, largest First Nations group in Canada. They're also hidden a show. So you see that, um, and we try to think about that concept when, we, when the work that we do. Um, a lot of times in a westernized society, for example, when we're grant writing, uh, we're often pitted against each other to get a better score. And, and, uh, and the way that we, we think about when we work with our collaborators 
or like and we may be going against somebody or another university or a cancer center for a grant but we shouldn't be pitted against each other in that way um we should be working together uh, jointly and collaboratively on everything that we do so you know it isn't like a uh, if we're at the same path and we're working in the same things and we may be competing against each other, but are there ways that we can work together to think about this kind of collective way of a bundled air approach um, to get the best um, outcomes for our people? And it isn't about just, I'm going to win a grant and serve one tribe. That's about, let's work together and help all of our people across the country. And that was kind of the goal of our center too, is like, let's provide a platform that other universities and cancer centers can look at and, and gain and learn from that have been replicated in other places. And you'll see that now. Um, I've been to a number of you know, cancer centers sharing kind of this, you know, what we've established. And I, and I see it trickling out to other cancer centers. And we're all collaborating and building uh, relationships to, to build centers out creatively in their own context. So that's been, a, that's been really awesome to see that. It's much needed. Um, and, you, you know, it hasn't been like that. Another important thing is to know your landscape. And I, I, we created this map with uh, GIS type plotting mechanisms. But on here, um, on the, the purple um, shades, you'll see the uh, fairly recognized tribes in the US. And then we um, plotted comprehensive cancer centers. Uh, uh, can cancer centers are basic laboratories that are associated with cancer centers. Um, just to kind of get a, a landscape of where um, Cancer centers are located in a proximity to fairly recognized tribes in the U.S. Um, one big thing that I, we did find here, if you look at this, is that uh, so NCI is the responsibility of NCI is to have cancer centers to serve the United States and the people of the United States. But if you look at this map and in this area here, there's not too much there. And in regards to NCI designated cancer center, that would be the Great Plains area. There's tons of tribes in that area here. <clears throat> and so there is a gap there. Now I you know, respectfully point that out to NCI when I make uh, conversations or have meetings with NCI that, you know, it would be great someday to serve that niche area here where there's a, a big gap in cancer care. What's also is interesting, a lot, of these, a lot of the NCI designated cancer centers are kind of like on the coastal areas as well. And so you'll see here in our area here, and I would, another thing that would be nice and maybe the universities or somebody would pick this up too, is kind of look at university context, um, land, land grant institu institutions, things of that nature. This map could really, re really blown out in different contexts to look at how representation of universities are into tribal areas. And this is just a cancer center approach looking at it. But beyond that, we, we also, you see that here and where we are located uh, in big, this whole area is Haudenosaunee lands here and then up here into Canada. Um, but also to know um, within the state what it looks like. And so uh, here are the counties um, that are related to uh, the tribes. So with, with each one of these shaded area here are um, uh, fairly recognized Haudenosaunee nations in New York uh, with their, their counties. So our goal with our center um, and with the cancer centers, you always hear this thing about catchment area. And it's usually like the counties that touch, you know, the service area of the immediate population. Well, that's not really true for uh, Indian country because our relations, you know, see this map across the, the, the state and into Canada. And so our catchment area is different than the kind of westernized or, or NCI designated kind of cancer area, the, the service area, because we, our people travel among, among the Confederacy quite often and have family in different areas. You have to be cognizant of that if you're working with tribe, tribes and, and uh, native patients that, you know, they may start service here, but may go up to um, uh, northern New York or into Canada for service. So you have to really bridge that kind of knowledge and liaisons with other um, universities or clinical context to serve uh, patients and families. And then uh, to, to bridge onto that, it's also to know, um, one, where you're situated in the U.S., where you're situated regionally and locally, but also to look at the um, disparities in, in the region and what that means. Um, 
And for us, it was cancer, but you know, cancer doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's it, usually it's a co-occurring condition. And so when you're in a, working with uh, patients, you should always be cognizant of um, other um, co-occurring conditions that are uh, that may have an issue, be an issue for that particular population. For us, you know, a lot of times it's obesity and diabetes and cancer kind of have this uh, relationship. So if you're if you're if you have somebody with cancer, you may also want to screen for diabetes or vice versa um, to to make sure that you're you know looking at different approaches to healthcare. So Mr. Seneca and I and a few others created this paper. Um, and what happens in a national level, a lot of times the statistics for a native uh, population is um, put forward in a way that covers the whole East Coast, East Coast or a certain corridor um, in the United States or service area, which includes like a bunch of different states. But within a bunch of those different states there are uh, tribes that are um, vastly different in culture, governance, traditions. And it's really hard to say, like, you know, for 20 tribes in this region, your health disparities are all the same. And your cancer rates are all the same. And this is what's coming out. Well, we know, like, that's probably not true. So what we did is we, we took the um, data from those uh, areas here, the counties that touch uh, fairly recognized nations. We did an aggregate report of mortality rates for 10 years back. And we put all those counties together not to identify like one tribe or another, but the Confederacy nations that are ancestrally related. By doing a 10 year um, uh, look back at mortality patterns, um, it gave us enough data to be statistically significant um, to show um, different things that are relevant to our people. And they were different than the, the Northeast kind of IHS picture and other stats that were said about us. And what, why that's important to uh, clinicians and nurses and other, other um, health allied fields is that now we know there's um, things that we can attend to when we see people. Uh, for example, liver disease was something that was uh, a concern among our nations as a, dis uh, as a disparity. So what is liver disease related to? It could be substance abuse, it could be hepatitis, it could be obesity or uh, fatty liver disease. And so, you know, if somebody comes into the clinic and has one of these ailments, now you should be thinking, well, you know, maybe I should check for uh, diabetes or substance or alcohol use and hepatitis. So that's the kind of information that we try to bring forward with these projects like this. It's really kind of translating that research um, into practice. That's our main goal when we do research. And so now I started a, a quick journey here on about like um, how are like wampum relationships and treaties important to our work. And, you know, now, you know, as an Indigenous uh, researcher and community member, and, and I was a clinician in our communities as a social worker for over 15 years on the ground, private practice, that these things are really important to not only for our people to remember, but for our allies and our other people that we work with to understand. Um, these are historical things that um, are important to who we are, but also historic in the way that their relationships with the United States and other countries. As uh, sovereign nations and as uh, native nations within the United States, we're seen as sovereigns, we are sovereigns, meaning that we have governance and jurisdictions that are different than the United States. And I was asked the other day, just yesterday about, you know, why, why can the tribe do this and that? And I, my response was, would you, ask, um, would, you, would you ask that same question to Canada? And they're like, probably not. And I said, well, we're in that same context of sovereignty on that conversation. You can't impose uh, um, some New York state or county different things that are, that you may see off territory. It's often, you know, it's a conversation between a tribe and the federal government. And it's based a lot in these uh, wampum and treaty uh, negotiations. And so how do we bring that into our, uh, our clinical context or our research context? This one here is a good one. Um, <clears throat> And it's a two-row wampum. You can't really see it because here, if I can click, can I click on it? Yeah. Um, and, and it talks about uh, our, the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch and later the French and English in Canada agreed on the principles to make this agreement last. It was the first friendship. Um, the Haudenosaunee and their white brothers will live in friendship. The second principle is peace. And there will be peace between the two peoples and the final principle is forever. 
And so on this wampum belt, which are like, um, they're in, in essence, they're contracts um, between people. And just like we would have a contract for XYZ nowadays, these are like original contracts between native people and visitors or, uh, to understand and provide agreements like MOUs. We did it in creating wampum belts. This wampum belt represented how um, you'll see he's holding uh, oh, a belt that has uh, white beads and then two uh, parallel purple lines, purple wampum beads. And the representation there is that uh, we have, uh, um, there's a river and within that river, there's two vessels traveling down it. One is a canoe or a, a boat representative of the native peoples and the other um, is a vessel from uh, non-native peoples that come, came into our landscape and or other tribal nations um, beyond, this, beyond the Haudenosaunee. And so what that means is that we, we may be traveling down the same parallel of uh, landscapes, existence, but that we don't necessarily get into each other's boat tippet, that we remain in our own boats. Uh, we travel and, and get to know each other and we, we respect each other's uh, governance, res respect each other's language, we, and we respect each other's health sovereignties. And so when you look, take that approach, um, you have to think about like our Indian health service um, units on the uh, territories, the health initiatives on territories, and how they blend and integrate, but at the same time are separate health care initiatives um, that are separate from the, the state or, or the U.S. And you'll see that in grant opportunities and service paradigms, Whatever, usually, whatever, if there's a grant opportunity available uh, in the US context, there's usually one for the tribes too. And so it's not the same. We can't apply for something that's available in Erie County or, or Buffalo. It's like you have to apply for the native based one if you're a tribe working in that context. And so um, that's really important to understand. And that's how we're trying to weave it into our, our contextual relationships with our grant understandings of working together. But yet, yet understanding that we're our health sovereigns and we have our research sovereignty. Other ones include like uh, the treaties and uh, our native to native, uh, native to nation research. And so you think about that, and that was one of the premise of our uh, center at Roswell Part Two, is that you no, know, we're not uh, just BIPOC people where like we have nation to nation representation um, and governance. When we deal on, on issues, it's usually with the United States. Even, we're, even though our tribes are based here in New York, it's the, when it comes to the, um, the end conversation, it's usually with the federal government. Um, and a lot of people also don't know that the first treaty of the United States, one of the first treaties in 1794 was in Canandaigua, New York, uh, with uh, the first president of the United States, George Washington. And treaties are noted as the supreme law of the land. Um, it was uh, a first kind of a agreement. It was the first agreements between tribes and uh, the federal government and it happened here in this region. So how do we in incorporate that into our writing and, and what we do and how we understand things? And so um, that's what we're trying to blend. That's what I'm trying to share here is like, you always hear that saying, if you don't remember your history, you're eventually, it's going to be repeated in some way or another. Read this sometime and understand more about um, the first treaties of the United States with the Haudenosaunee. And, uh, you know, it's good practice to learn your history. It's even better practice to put it in action. Um, the, another one I want to share here is the Snyder Act. And what that means to education and healthcare. So. The journey of kind of incorporating of wampums to treaties to current day legislation, I think is really important and how you conceptualize um, healthcare and research with native populations. For example, there's, uh, there's, this is the act right here, the Snyder Act. I just highlighted a couple of things that are important, uh, including education, uh, relief for distress and uh, con conservation of health, uh, existing Indian uh, irrigation systems and the development for water supplies. And when I read that, I like, okay, that's our environmental uh, aim of our center in cancer. So this, this act speaks to the work that we're doing and how do we integrate that into our, our research? How do we integrate that from research practice and changes for our communities? Um, as a language in there for uh, 
maintenance of uh, physicians, and also for the purchase of horse-drawn and motor-propelled passenger carrying vehicles. So there might be enough. There might be a chance one day that you'll see a horse and a horse coming through Roswell Park or across <laughs> UP um, based on this Snyder Act where I write it into a grant. But you know, but those are the things that are you know it's written there. Um, the same thing you look at our annuity cloth um, that we uh, have. It's a, uh, has a symbol symbolic relationship with the federal government that we have we receive cloth every year as part of a. Um, a lot of these things were in trade for our land, for example. Our land was taken, and in, in, in exchange, we were given these acts, and those acts and different things provide health care provisions or other things that the federal government is responsible for, basically, the exchange of land. But <clears throat> So I'm not lying. Like, one day, I think I will probably put that in the ground and have a horse or something. <laughs> but, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's a one way of trying to be creative. And the, another one that uh, is important to understand is this one here. And um, it's the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. It's pretty lengthy. Uh, I just grabbed a couple snippets. But if you even if you start reading here, it talks about contract health service, um, behavioral health, and there's a lot in there. So how do you how do you um, include this in what you're doing and the responsibilities? First is reading and understanding what pieces fit to uh, whatever part of uh, academia or service or research that you're doing. But how do you read, integrate, you know, from wampum to treaty to current day legislation? And how do you keep responsibility um, from the university to understand this back to the community? And this is just a snippet that I'm including in, in uh, every grant going forward. It talks about the relationship of all of those things. So, um, you know, this is just our take on um, putting this into grants and, and at least having uh, reviewers and, and uh, grant reviewers and, and uh, Federal committees look at that and begin to think about to understand. Maybe they'll read it and maybe they'll understand what that means to Native communities in a sovereign to health context. I'm happy to share that. I'll share these slides so anybody wants to use it. And like I was saying in the beginning, it's not about me being successful, it's about us being successful for our people collectively. So I like to share that stuff. Um, I don't consider it like intellectual property. That's the kind of stuff that we need to all use in our grants so that we can all be successful to help um, our people in this region and beyond. And so, you know, when I, uh, a lot of institutions in Western New York are old institutions, right? And Roswell Park, I think it was founded in 1868. I'm not sure when UB was founded. Does anybody know offhand? I'm guessing it's 1800s sometime. I'm sorry? 1846. 1846. And so, uh, and that's my challenge to like universities. What has been your uh, strategic plan since 1846 to work with the tribes whose land you ancestrally sit on, like we opened with, with the land acknowledgement? What is the, what has been the progression of working with tribes and what has been the responsibility and in, in, in that? And, you know, for many of our institutions, and it's not, I'm not saying it in a negative way, but here's an opportunity to, to look back and understand where you're at and where you're going to go. For us, it, you know, I, it, when I first started at Roswell, I was pretty much the only one there. And I started recognizing that. I started recognizing a lot of things. And I'm not one to be, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like respectfully persistent about stuff. I'm not like mean about it. I'm just like, you know, this, let, let's talk about this. And we should talk about that as part of that conversation and strategic planning. And, uh, and slowly but surely, we started making uh, changes and movements about uh, bringing more people on to help out. And one thing I'll say about Rosal Park is they invested a lot um, of infrastructure into building out our center and to recruiting and to retaining um, Indigenous faculty and staff and, and across all sectors, not just within our center, but across all sectors. And so with that, our center uh, emerged. Uh, we wrote a grant within, I think, maybe less than six months. It was probably about eight months after having a center. We were awarded probably about five grants during the pandemic. 
the first one being over $3 million and provided um, almost 15 jobs for our community members. That's part of strategic planning, understanding your history of where your institution's at, um, braiding in uh, some of these wampum and, and uh, kind of contemporary legislation and, and holding, um, I wouldn't say holding, but just keeping the government aware. It's like, hey, let's work together and, and, and improve this relationship and bring our communities in. Um, there are probably about, I don't know, 25,000 or more Haudenosaunee just here in Buffalo and Niagara region. We should be at the table, a lot of things. But um, they are our staff group. Um, our grant that we wrote for our patient navigation um, initiatives um, was based in the two row wampum kind of paradigm and, and philosophy. And that we paired uh, a native navigator on territory with a non native na navigator off territory in a rural context, that uh, in a fairly qualified health center, and that our navigators uh, kind of rode on that stream together one working in a fairly qualified health center, one working in uh, Indian Health Service, um, not necessarily uh, getting in each other's ship, but knowing how we interact with our rural neighbors um, and that we understand our health sovereignties and that we, we try to work together to, to achieve a better relationship or a continued relationship um, on a kind of a parallel track, but also understanding where we need to go. So that's kind of how our uh, navigator is paired in Western New York. And then um, we've also uh, bridged our uh, virtual navigation to other tribes across New York as well. So it's been a really uh, a project that, you know, when you think about like how you've made change as an individual or as a citizen to responsibility, going to school and giving back to your community, I can honestly say this is one of those um, areas that we've made change. We, we initially um, did a, a QI or quality improvement projects with um, some Indian health service centers, um, some community uh, not-for-profits and uh, federally qualified health centers and community organizations about how, what does a cancer care continuum look like um, for your tribal nation and, what, and how does it look in a rural context? And from those conversations, it, would, it came out to be like patient navigation. And then we also did another project that looked at the data, looking at prostate and breast cancer, um, the two initiatives that we had focus on and we did find disparities there. So between um, the, the data that we found working with Indian Health Service and the CDC and others to look at those disparities in cancer and also the uh, quality improvement uh, conversations and uh, focus groups and the roundtables that we had in communities, both on the US side and the Canadian side, it came down to patient navigation. And now there's a big push for patient navigation nationally. Um, you know, it's been, uh, it's one of those things that I could say, yes, we did, we, we translated our quality improvement into immediate action in our communities and we started saving lives. So we're very proud of that. And these are just some of the, in the community context, um, some of the areas that we've worked with, um, not-for-profits, grassroots organizations, tribal departments, foundations, uh, virtual partnerships, intertribal connections, community to community. So as you may or may not know, and, and a lot of the uh, research um, governance, uh, you know, in a university context, you, you write a proposal, you get an IRB, um, and then you begin the research. In a tribal research context, um, you start with the community, you help co-formulate ideas about research, uh, research to practice, and then you have to get tribal approval. And there's a whole other layer to that, and each tribe is different. And so a lot of times it's it's government to government tribal research responsibilities. But in the service context, like when we, we uh, and research and quality improvement are different, right? So quality improvement, you're going in to learn about services and, and to enhance or build on what's uh, the existing structures where research, you're, you're going in to discover something and then share it like globally or a QI or like working with the tribe or organization, uh, the organization. And then you bring back some ideas about service changes or paradigms, and then you make the service changes. And it's not a research context. It's you're making uh, changes uh, with the organizations for the people. And then you may evaluate whether it's working or not working. But some of our greatest allies in the work that we do are um, internally with the grassroots organizations. Um, that's one thing that we discovered too, is like, 
it really is our, um, the people in the community on the ground are making the change too. It's not for profits that are integrated um, both on reservation territories, but adjacent to reservations that are working with native people that are making big change. It's the federally qualified health centers who are working with native people and all populations adjacent in rural areas that are making change and how do we understand that and how can we be part of that? Um, and it's the intertribal conversations that are really making change too. Among our Haudenosaunee, remember those uh, five original tribes and there are six tribes that came to this region and it's, I think it was 1600s as a Tuscarora nation in Niagara Falls. And how, we, how do we understand our relationships with those tribes in health context? How do we even understand even further back when um, during the Trail of Tears and um, other, um, when, the, when our tribes were removed to different areas, that relationship. After I leave here today, I'm going to Oneida Nation in Wisconsin uh, to learn more about their health programming and how it integrates and how we can bridge our Confederacy nations back together in a health context by learning from each other. All important. So I'm going to get into a little bit about like uh, the diversity context about how, how can you as clinicians or nurse practitioners or nursing students or LPNs or areas that um, you're currently in the academics for or teaching about or a part of um, from a native context, what's important. Um, hospitals may be seen as an extension of dominant society's government, meaning the things that have happened in the past um, may have influence on the way your, your patients or community members come to you in the hospital or in a community uh, health center. This may not be because uh, you're a health professional. Maybe it is. Maybe there's medical mistrust there too. But a lot of times it's about things that have happened to our communities over time and how we react to it. And in those conversations that we have at the kitchen table um, about things that have happened in the past, and it carries on to the next generation of our conversations. Um, the residual effects of oppression on boarding schools, and you, as uh, you're learning more and more about this, if you haven't heard about boarding schools, uh, I'm not gonna go too deep into it here, but I encourage you to um, Google uh, Native American boarding schools or residential boarding schools. And uh, um, basically in a nutshell, it was uh, our children were taken away we weren't allowed to practice our culture or healthcare, you know, vision of being what a healthy relationship or being in a healthy circumstance was vastly changed. Um, our culture, language, all these things were taken away with and we were tried, our, our younger generation was put in the context of being Americanized. Um, we weren't allowed to practice our uh, religions or our traditions. So there's this whole era, one uh, generation or two that were really stripped from that. And it caused a lot of, uh, changes in, in the way things are. But I say that we're coming back and we're talking about it more. Things are changing. Canada has a good example with truth and rec reconciliation. So here's your homework. Learn about boarding schools and learn about uh, Canada's truth and reconciliation. And the third thing is learn about how the U.S. the U.S. is re um, response to truth and reconciliation, what that means to the work that you do. Um, it's a big topic. But, you know, that's a challenge for me to you. Learn a little more about that, how it um, influences um, the work that you're doing with the, with the people from our communities. Understanding value systems, um, you know, and uh, I don't put this in like, you know, this is one uh, group of people and this is another group of people, because I think we all have value systems that we learn um, and but also think about the value systems of our ancestors. Where are your ancestors from? What are their value systems? How does that compare with uh, current uh, American value systems? And how does that relate to indigenous-based value systems? And I think a lot of us are kind of a hybrid or a mix of that. So we may fall in uh, a few of these categories here. Well, if you look at different value systems, um, one is cooperative, like we talked about the, um, the way the Haudenosaunee came together, in our collective nature being co uh, cooperative um, or competitive. And I talked about that too, how we're often have to write grants for things and we're in a competitive environment. We're trying to graduate from school, we're trying to do this and that. So, you know, that's why we're, we're walking in two different worlds a lot of times and being a competitive and a, and a collective and uh, how, do we, how, do we in, how do we walk that path? And what does it mean to us? Um, tribal and group emphasis or in individualism, is it me? Um, trying to grow as a director 
and it's just me. Uh, you know, that was my thing. It's like, no, the only way we can grow is if we embrace the, the collective strength of all of us together and keep building our collective. Um, and, and it's a group emphasis. I always share everybody in our, uh, our staff that we have now as a leader. They can go out anytime and talk about anything that we've done or, or the projects that we're doing. Let's collectively, we talk about that. And that's what builds our strength. It's not just an individual effort. It's a collective effort. Um, extended family importance. Um, you know, living in a, a tribal territory where we live often among our relations, our cousins, our aunts, our grandmothers. Um, so we have that kind of uh, importance of, and understanding of helping each other out. And I think as a nurse practitioner or working in a nursing field, that's really important too, that there are different types of support uh, systems. Um, the idea of patience um, is really important, and especially indigenous uh, societies, respect for age. We have a lot of ties to our elders, ties to nature, what all, which also fits to our land-based kind of healing and learning. Um, and this, a lot of this here sometimes is put into our academic life, right? And you look at that, as all that's me today, and as I, as I walk into a, a, a university or a cancer center, academics or whatever, you know, this a lot of time is need to get an A or, you know, but when you go home, it might be this value system. And when, but I think, uh, you know, it's, it's really understanding how you fit this and how you blend that into where you want to be um, in your next stage in life. Some important concepts with uh, kind of uh, confidentiality on small tribal rural communities. Like, I, you know, like we live close to each other for generations, so we kind of know everything about everybody, which is good and bad sometimes. Um, but if you think about, if you think right now, like where, where you live, like do you know all your neighbors and you know all their histories and do you know their parents? Some maybe, some maybe not. But oftentimes on a reservation, we do. You know, you know, in some contexts, a lot of people's stories. And uh, it's, it's uh, enlightening and enriching sometimes, but at other times, it's very hard to. And I always give uh, props out to my uh, mentor, Bernie Huber, uh, who initially helped me get into grad school here at UB and was a great colleague. And I don't know if he's still teaching here or not, but he was an adjunct professor here for many years. He said confidentiality in a Native community is not just a good idea, it's the law. You know, um, and me, it's like, it's not just the law, but it's our reputation and livelihood. If we break confidentiality in our neighborhood, like you're done as a social worker, you're done as you know, like your career is just done. So you know, I tell people in private practice, you know, what you tell me goes to the grave. You know, I, you know, I'm not gonna. It's just the way I approach all that. And the same with our research. You know, it's like, you know, <clears throat> you have to be ethical along the along the whole way, and sometimes you make it to the point of like you're ready to submit a grant, and it's like, eh, I don't think that's you know, it's not that for the best of our people. We may have put a year into that and be like, we're going to have to pull it and re revamp it for something else later on. But that's the part where it's like you have to make a choice and I know how you approach that. But it's really important when you work with tribes and patients. Confidentiality is important. If you have a few Native families you're working with, make sure you don't somehow like indirectly talk about something because it can be harmful in a way. So we, we know we know a lot about our communities. Um, I put the micro, meso, macro in there. You know, how do we work amongst our uh, making an individual healthy and then working with the family to make the family healthy. And then you have, if you have cohorts of healthy families, you have a healthy community kind of approach. So it's really important that when you, when you see a, a, a native patient, it's usually more than just an individual context. Um, that's another thing, learning the disparities, but also learning about the uh, the family context of relationships and then the family context of relationships to community. And by doing that, you start to make a uh, larger level of health changes. Uh, female and male structures in client communities. Um, this is important too. Uh, in uh, Haudenosaunee nations, it's, it's a matrilineal society. So you're working with... Um, the mother or the grandmother or the woman leader of the family, often. Um, that's really important to know when you work with families. And I, I don't know how, I, it's, our creation story is based on um, Sky Woman and our 
a lot of our lineage and stories and, and the way things happen in our society are all matrilineal, which may be different than the American context, the Canadian context, or a context of other populations in the US. So something to be noted. Just gonna go through these here. Also knowing uh, some context about urban and suburban areas and talked a little bit about that, how uh, a lot of our people move sometimes between territories. I may be here um, this summer, um, but in the fall, I might be at another territory. Uh, we have a grant now working with the St. Regis Mohawk in Northern New York, where we're working with the students. So our team, some of our team members are from that area. They will live up there and they work with the students. We go up there on occasion, stay in the community for a week or so. And then they come back and live here in Buffalo. So how do their, when we had this, like our students, um, how could their Indian healthcare service be tra uh, transitioned to here for their healthcare while they're summer students, for example? And what are the, how does that, how do the health systems interact with each other? And so that's just kind of knowing like urban reservation and rural. Um, hold on, next one. Communication styles, I'll just share one on humor here. Um, humor is a big thing in Indian country. And I think with a lot of people and populations too, um, it can be used as a way to increase comfort. Um, it can be used um, oftentimes um, as a defense mechanism, even um, to avoid a, a topic they may, may not want to talk about. If you see that come into your conversation and they tell a joke, they might signal, hey, it's probably an important thing, maybe. It's trying to deflect the issue. So um, storytelling is a, um, really important. We tend to tell stories in a lot of our work that we do. Um, so how can you as a, a student or a professor or a diversity um, department help understand more about the work um, that you do with indigenous peoples? Um, you know, sometimes there's you strive towards treatment competency. Um, Deepen collaborative efforts with diverse healthcare settings. Um, join boards. Go to um, learn more. Uh, go to community events on the territories. There's a Native Urban Center, center in Buffalo. Um, attend event, events and learn more about the people that you work with. And it, it goes back to, again, to the, the treaties and, and our relationships between people. And you can see how that kind of conversation can transcend into the work that you do today. Uh, I'll also share this uh, here, and you can't see the top too well here, but um, one of my other colleagues, Warren Sky Jr., uh, he, uh, he, he shared this during a presentation one time. He's a UB grad too, and a social worker. And he said, uh, he wanted to add this to the DSM, and it was called Generalized uh, Ignorance Disorder, Not Otherwise Specified. <laughs> he says, don't let people get caught in this. He said, uh, you know, a source of learning and developing strategies for future interventions is important. Um, and beyond interventions, it's for us, it's research too. How do we bring research to practice and service to our people? Uh, worker feelings of ignorance and, or incompetence. Let's not get trapped in that. And so, you know, just think about that, um, what he had mentioned and what he shared about generalized ignorant disorder. And I think it, 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 it's applied over generations. You know, it isn't just us and now, but it's something that we, you know, maybe one day it will be added to the DSM. Shaping the future. Um, and some of the things I just mentioned. I don't know, I only have a few minutes left, so I want to get into just a couple of things here. Um, I'll share this one real quick. So a quick story on diversity. Um, in, the, in the beginning of time, uh, we've always had this game called lacrosse. And raise your hand if you've heard of lacrosse or seen lacrosse. So, okay, now raise your hand if you knew that was a Haudenosaunee origin medicine game, about half. So the, the game of lacrosse, which actually lacrosse isn't even a um, Haudenosaunee word or a native word. Lacrosse is a French word because uh, when the French came to our landscapes in the kind of the northern New York and Quebec area, uh, seeing us playing this game, didn't know what to call it. Now the, the only thing they could uh, think it resembled was what the Bishop Crozier, what the bishops carried, a long stick with a hook on the end. So they said, "Oh, 
we're going to name that lacrosse. And so that's actually not a, um, it's not even an American word. It's a French word that was borrowed by the U.S. that was a misrepresentation of the, our medicine game. And so the um, our game, uh, the word for it is um, the wante. No, that's that donkey. It's close to that. <laughs> uh, but I can't remember. I can't remember the name for lacrosse at the moment. But um, in Seneca, it means it has netting in it. And in Mohawk, it means bumping hips. So even our tribes had different names for it. Um, and uh, so in the, in many tribes across the world have this kind of stick ball game. But for us, it's a medicine game. And for us, the conversation of a stick ball game happened even before the creation of Earth in the sky world when um, our, our uh, one side was in battle with the other over a creation of things. And a game was played. And to settle that, the stick ball version game was played. Then it came to kind of our where we live now. Um, and the, some of the first games um, have stories about how the animals played the birds. And so in that game, the four-legged animals were on one side and the winged birds were on the other. And the three creatures came up. And of course, everybody wanted to play in this game because it was like this big game. And, you know, it was a historic game. Everybody wanted to play. And so the three creatures came up and they said, uh, we want to play in this game. And, the first, and the, they said, well, I'm sorry, two creatures. They came up and they said, we want to play. And they said, well, we don't know what you are. And you're really small. And uh, uh, we don't want you on our team. They came up to the animals. And the animals, um, why don't you go ask the birds? And so they didn't give up. They had courage. They went on. They went over to the bird side and said, we want to play in this game. And they said, well, you have four legs and you're small. You know, we don't know what you are either. And I said, but let us have a conversation about um, having you on our team. So they talked about it and they said, yeah, you know, but only if you agree to some changes in, the, in your anatomy. And they said, okay. And so the first one, they said, uh, we're going to tie uh, drum leather to your back. And by having leather on your back, you'll have the ability to fly. Does anybody know what kind of uh, animal has four legs and can fly and that has jagged wings? There's only a few animals with four legs that can fly. A bat. A bat. So the first one became a bat. And then uh, the drum leather they had, there wasn't much left, not enough to make another set of wings. So they said, can we stretch your body out? And all the um, birds pulled on the creature's body, pulled it apart and stretched it out. So another animal, four legs. I'll give you a hint. They can glide. Flying squirrel. Flying squirrel. So the game began. And in the old games, it wasn't like the ones you see on TV or at the university, but it was in this large field. Could be miles long. Like the old games are huge fields. And on one end, uh, not like a uh, like current day uh, nets, there was kind of like a pole, two poles that stood up almost like a NFL football upright in a way. And uh, you could score either way. You shoot through it or back the other way or hit the pole and you get a point. And the game, traditional games were played to three uh, because the fields were so long and there were so many people playing, it took a long time. And so the first, uh, the first ball was thrown up in the air and uh, right away the flying squirrel got a hold of it, glided down, scored. The game went on for a very long time um, and the animal scored. So now it was tied 1-1. The determining goal on goal three was played for a long time, and eventually the bat got the ball zigzagged around the sky and hit the post. So the, the, the bat and the squirrel were, you know, champions in this game. But, what, but the, you know, in our stories, we talk about how a lot of we, we look at these stories in different ways, and they tell different stories within the stories. And to in this one, uh, we, we think about our, our diversity in nature. It's like, no matter what you look like, whether you're small, whether you have four legs, jagged wings, uh, whether you're uh, a big bear or a big animal, it's like we all we all have our place and our and the way we we work together. And uh, in science, we have all we all have our own skill sets. You know, some are qualitative, some are quantitative, some are basic scientists, some are behavioral interventionists, behavior interventionists. But collectively, when you put all that together, you have team science, like a, like a team like this one. And that's usually the ones that win. 
Um, so we have to open our minds to have um, areas that we may be uncomfortable with um, to work together. And, and by working together in that way, we achieve greatness. And so that is kind of our, our story of um, lacrosse. And lacrosse is really part of our, uh, it's beyond like a sport to our people. It's part of our uh, medicine uh, ways of life. Our young, young ones, are, from the time you can start walking or are playing lacrosse. And so it's really the fabric of who we are. And it's built in our medicine. But stories like that are really important. That, you know, that everybody's built a different way and, and we all have our own ways of thinking. But we all, at the same time, need to work together to be successful. And then I'll end with this. Um, these are my two daughters here, slightly older now, but some of my two favorite pictures here. And, um, and within the Haudenosaunee and many Native nations, we have a philosophy or a way of thinking that the things that we do now are really a foundation for seven generations forward. So the conversations that I have today with you, talking about some of our history, and relationship to the U.S. and how that comes into play um, in our healthcare and our research, and how we bring our strategic plan here to work collectively with other people and other tribes is really about your kids, 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 kids. You know what I'm saying? It isn't now. Um, it isn't a grant cycle that ends in two years. It isn't a class that you're taking now. It's really your projection of how you bring that knowledge seven generations forward. And that's how we survive as a people. And that's how our um, society survives or should survive. It's not the here and now, it's generations forward that we build foundation for. So, thank you. Um, Tonight on time, maybe we'll have to focus on questions here. I understand if you have to scoot, um, given that that it's about one o'clock. So I think we have some chat comments too, but if there's anybody in the room and can you stay for a few minutes yeah, too? Yeah. But anybody have any questions right now? Looks like not any questions. Oh, hold on. Your collective models from staff research committee is so vital and energizing, not just about discipline and nursing, but really about important tenants. I have a question. Go ahead, Megan. Yes, please. Uh, so I've never worked with Native population at all. So but one thing that you mentioned is about uh, linking the, 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 your nations have their own uh, grant mechanisms. We have our own grant mechanisms. Can you talk a little bit more about how they can work together? You know, in a collective way that you know. I don't know. Does that make sense? I'm not even sure how to yeah. articulate my question, but it sounds like they're separate. So, how do you bring them together? Your suggestions for that? Bringing it together is as, uh, having conversations about it, and uh, too too often, uh, many times, we don't have our conversations. Like we may be sitting here today, and be like, "Huh, I didn't know that." And but the, the important piece is taking action on that conversation. So how do you, um, you know, if you're filled with say education, call the education department at the tribe and say, hey, you know, I'm interested in learning more. Uh, we want to collaborate. Uh, can we either uh, maybe if you're writing a grant, maybe there's some synergies there. Vice versa, if you're writing a grant, uh, maybe there are synergies that you can work with them on. So I think it's really about having that conversation, uh, taking action. Um, we live, we've been living in a world of cyberness too for so long. And now I'm like, I'm just going to go knocking on doors. So where I work now, I usually knock on doors, you know, because a lot of times you have a meeting and you're like, oh, we don't have time for that. Or maybe in two, two weeks, you just go to the door and knock and say, hey, one more. So can I piggyback on that, please? Um, I'm Dean Seneca. I teach Indigenous Health Disparities. Oh, well. and I hope everybody can hear me uh, because, I don't know, for about a year, I was sending many grant opportunities to UB, the partner, to develop, and I would, we would have a discussion, have a meeting, and quite honestly, every time there was like, oh, I'm too busy with this, or I'm too busy with that, or we can't do this, or we can't do that, or it takes time, and 
you know, I got a little frustrated because these are really great opportunities. The university could be the lead. I even said I would write the proposal. Nelson, some adjunct, write me in the proposal. We can do some outreach. And it kind of got frustrating because meetings were developed. We would have these meetings and they were just canceled. So now what I do is I'll take grant opportunities. I'll send them to my UB colleagues. And then I'll also send them to the University of Rochester. Well, the University of Rochester jumps on everyone. And uh, we just were awarded a HRSA grant and we're doing a project developing a workshop on stigma in indigenous communities. And the relationship I have to say has been great because they take initiative. They have two other research areas they want to look with, with cortisol levels and boarding school survivors and uh, some other work. And now they've offered me to teach a class there. So this is my home. This is my university. My school I graduated from is right there. And I try all the time to send stuff to UB and no one does anything. You know, but I sent it to the University of Rochester. They jump on it. And the grant we have now is a Hertzer grant. It's like 1.2 million. Um, it's a really great project. They're very excited because now we've we've partnered with Seneca Strong in developing this workshop. And now Onondaga is involved and Chief Warren Lyons, Faith Keepers now is coming in supporting the project. And now we're reaching out to Aqua Cessna and I'll be calling you Rodney. But, you know, I mean, it, it just, if, if people want, in the school of public health or the school of nursing want to work with indigenous communities, please feel free to reach out to me, reach out to Rodney. Rodney will send you back to me. You know, I, I'm here and I'm willing to work with people. It's just, it's just so frustrating because, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start to have, and I hate to feel like this, but it, it's like a, we're going through a Mulligan's kind of conversation and there's never any genuine interest, you know? But I think, you know, if we really want to do this, I'm right here, I'm right in the backyard. Um, I'm going to be teaching Indigenous Health Disparities in an hour right over at Diefendorf, where I took my freshman architecture class <laughs> back in 1985. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm here and willing to help and help do those things to build that Indigenous component within our health systems area. So I just, I had to throw that out there if you said yeah, that because... It, but I'm kind of an assistant professor here, so I'm still sort of, you know, I just moved here mm -hmm. years ago, so... I mean, I, I and my response is directed to you. It's, it's directed at it to all the people that I've sent emails to and at the school of public health. It's disappointing to hear that, but it's yeah. I sit here and I think this is an opportunity. You know, but it's I think it's like you so, know, find your champions here. Um, create that strategic plan. I always start out with that. Because we've been here since the movie's been here since eighteen hundreds, mm -hmm. but what has the strategic plan been during that time? If there isn't one, or, or if there was one, bring it back up. Fellowship on it. Build conversations with Dean and others, and you know myself. And you know, I think we, there's, there's just, there is opportunity here. There is a new center for Indigenous studies here as well. And how do we build a collaborative beyond that to other departments? Because it isn't just like one department. To make change, you have to you have to make change across everything. Right. Just so you're aware, the, the nurse practitioner program, we have been sending students to the Tuscora Indian Reservation for years now and had grants with them. And our one of our full-time faculty now is the nurse practitioner at Tuscora. And so our students are getting uh, a lot on indigenous health. We're, we're, we want to participate in the Tuscora Pride Day over the summer. We do a health fair for Tuscora every fall. We give all their flu shots to them and have a health fair in terms of wellness. So I really think that, uh, and we'll continue to roll that out, especially now that we bought, brought Dr. Adams on board um, to give us more knowledge about it. But I just want to say that we really are trying to clinically have engagement with the, the Tuscarora and uh, brought them an opportunity for telehealth a couple of years ago to a grant that we had. Um, we had connectivity problems. The reservation doesn't have good internet. Um, but uh, again, there are opportunities that we would love to continue to um, grow with. So I just wanted to let you know that we were working to that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I would mention it oh. comes in waves. When I arrived at UB in 1993, this school of nursing had two native specific programs. There was a specific nurse practitioner program. The other one I have trouble saying, there was a specific nurse a nest a nest system, system. Yeah, no, you say that yes. program. I mean, that was decades ago. So there have been times when the university has invested. There have been times when it wanes. 
the potential is here. So maybe with folks in this audience building more, I loved hearing about what you know the current stuff at Tuscarora. She's at Los Angeles Aurora today. Today is her practice day, and she is the nurse practitioner out there today. So the possibilities are there. And I the word I'm gonna take away from your presentation, so many things, but I love the way you use the word braiding, how we can come together, different strands can come together. We can braid, we can weave, we can work on health together. Now we go up. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Thank Dr. You. Herring. Oh. <laughs> Oh, oh, you're still there? Yeah. Still there. yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought I missed you. I thought the presentation ended. <laughs> I apologize. Um, I have a question. I'm actually from uh, North Carolina near the Cherokee Reservation. And um, I, I've personally noticed, I guess, in the area, there's been a lot of tension. Um, and, and of course, it's quite understandable why there is mistrust. Um, but in the past year, the tension is unfortunately just still so high, and there have been instances where uh, community members have actually blocked Caucasian nurses from even entering the um, community health center. Um, and, and so I'm just wondering, you know, what recommendations you have when tension and distrust um, is still so high that they're actually preventing people um, trying, trying to help in the community. And, and I certainly understand why, like, uh, what would cause that distrust, but, uh, personally as a nurse, um, I'm, I'm not sure kind of what to do to help that situation. So I love your perception. Yeah. I know that a lot of tribes closed borders because we're sovereign nations during the pandemic may have been part of that time, um, for, uh, health protection from people that weren't from the community. I know that happened in quite a few uh, tribal jurisdictions. So, and I heard it help, happening to health practitioners that were coming in to help too, only because they weren't uh, from the reservation community or didn't live on territory. So that may have been a circumstance, but I think um, just entering into conversations and finding champions in the community that are uh, open to learning more about the relationship building. Um, it, could be, it could be the health center, but it also could be grassroots organizations or not-for-profits that uh, work within the community. So I'd start there. Um, I'd start learning and uh, more about who and where um, those relationships can build. There's a great doctor there um, at Cherokee Health. Her name is Blythe Winchester. Uh, she's an MD. She's a great person to work with. So if you um, have an opportunity um, to reach out to her, um, she could probably provide you some more guidance too on uh, areas that may be helpful. Blythe Winchester, MD. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm Linda sorry, that's a question. Oh, One more question, and I think we're going to have to tie it up just because we're going to be on our time. Go ahead. Okay, I put this in the chat, but I was wondering if you have difficulty providing data back to the um, funding organization if it's governmental, um, because the um, the nation's residents or council aren't supportive of that. Um, and if it's a research project, then the tribes have full governance over protections of that data. And so any research when it's set up should be set up with either a data user agreement or some kind of information that protects that data. And ideally, um, it should be the tribe that has all the data to begin with for many research related contexts. Service-related data is, is different in a way um, because it's service data that, you know, a lot of organizations have their own data for evaluation purposes, for example. So um, that's true as anything from uh, healthcare to um, the car dealer who buys this native that buys a car. There's a lot of data out there, right? It's beyond just health. And so it really depends on the context of the data. If you're talking about federal data, that's also a challenge too, because a lot of our Indian health services provide data um, back to the federal government on, on different things. And then it doesn't always come back to the tribes. And that's been a concern for a long time. Um, I think that's being looked at. I'm hoping it will change um, because data can really tell a strong story about many different things. Um, but it should always be um, at the protection and uh, guidance of the tribal nation. 
So would you say that they should release the information to us of what they will accept us to then release to the um, funding agency? Is that what you're saying? Every tribe is different. I would, um, I, would, I would work with the tribe and ask them how they want their data presented and what they want released. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Have you seen problems with funding agencies if you put it in that way? Funding agencies usually don't have the um, knowledge and review capacity of knowing what should be protected by sovereign governance. So it's really on the onus of the one that's doing the work okay. to make sure that you yourselves are working in a respectful fashion to work as close as you can with your tribal partner or whoever has okay. needed data. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Please feel free to mull around, get some food, ask some questions here. But thank you. And thank you, everyone, on Zoom. Excellent.